Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Benick. Today's April 5th, and spring has finally arrived in New Hampshire. Did you turn your heat off today? First thing I did, actually yesterday. Didn't it feel great to open the windows and say, my God, it's finally here? So we're all innovated. And, you know, despite spring coming on everybody's minds these days is what is going on in Concord? What is happening with our state legislators? So just like last week, we're going to be talking about what is going on in Concord again this week. Um, now, as you haven't seen the show yet, but maybe by the time you see this one, you will have seen it. Last week, Senator Jeb Bradley was down here, and uh, he talked about things from the Senate perspective. So this week, we're going to focus on the House side of things. Now, as I mentioned during that last show, you know, I genuinely am trying to have the audience of Tell It Like It Is be able to hear both sides of, of a debate. And I, I've really, really tried to do that on every subject that we've had. We weren't always successful because we couldn't always get people on a different side of an issue to speak. But I do want you to know, I have put invitations out to the Democrats. I have. Um, I don't know. I guess they're awfully busy because so far we haven't been able to book one. We, I, 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 well, let me correct myself. We did have Chris Pappas, who's the Democratic um, uh, member of Governor's Council from this area, and he came in and he did a great job and talked about a lot of issues. But in terms of legislators, sharks, we just can't seem to get those Democrats, Democrats to want to come in and talk. Don't understand it. We'll keep trying. But meanwhile, that does not mean that we stifle the Republicans. Uh-uh. Uh, we will keep the Republicans coming because they love to come and let us know what's on their mind and talk about the issues that they strongly believe in and are willing to push. So having said that, today's guest is somebody who definitely would be known to all of you. And, you know, the name of the show is Tell It Like It Is. And all of you who have watched it for a while know that my favorite thing in this world is to have guests who do tell it like it is. Um, I'm really not interested in people who pander or postpone giving an opinion or whatever. I want people to be able to come in and say what they think and stand behind it. And, you know, of all the people in New Hampshire, I think that probably one of the best people to do exactly that is today's guest because he has a long record of telling it like it is and he's not afraid to do it and by gory does it often and well um, so having said that I have to say my guest today is representative Bill O'Brien who all of you will remember was speaker of the house when the Republicans had the majority which means um, right up through to 2012. And he's been a guest here before. In fact, he was a guest here in September. Um, and definitely, if you didn't see that show then, catch it on the show website, which is www.tellitlikeitisnh.com. And if you look under the menu uh, bar that says public officials and click on that, you'll see his name and you can go right to that show and look at it because it was good. We, we covered a lot of things. Now, Representative O'Brien, as I said, you know him well. Um, he certainly was very, very well known as speaker. Um, he's from Mount Vernon and he represents Hillsborough District 5. And I won't go through all his background because, again, you can watch that previous show. Plus, we have so many good things to talk about. I don't want to spend time on that. I want to get right to the meat. Bill, it is so good to have you here well, again. Th thank you for having me here. And you're right, spring is coming outside. But, you know, Kathy, in Concord, it's going to remain the winter of our discontent because the budget they're putting together there is not going to take New Hampshire forward. Well, I mean, for openers, when one of the big pieces of it involved expanded gambling to the tune of $80 million, and we do not have legislation that allows expanded gambling. I mean, to me, right away, that, that signaled problems. Well, it, it shocked many of us that the governor would put forward a, a budget that's based upon um, the occurrence of an illegal activity. It's a, illegal to have casino gambling in New Hampshire. Now, whether it happens or not, we will see. Uh, the more many of us look at it, the more uncomfortable we become. But even if it is enacted, one thing I think is becoming abundantly clear, that $80 million licensing fee is not likely to be received during this upcoming budget cycle. 
Uh, it takes a long time to yeah. put these together. Regulations aren't in place. Building isn't in place. Um, it is, there's this sinking feeling that a number of us have that this um, whole proposal, this whole scheme, is being wired to um, uh, one company. And, you know, if, if anything... Which, that's not a good thing. No, if, if anything, that, that can't be the New Hampshire way. And so, you know, a number of us are uncomfortable with this specific proposal for a number of reasons. We don't think it'll be an economic panacea for the state. We don't think it'll be a budgetary plus in the end for state government. Uh, we think in the end the, the costs of having this uh, casino in, in uh, New Hampshire may well outweigh whatever cash flow comes from it. And you know something else, uh, Kathy, that really does bother me quite a bit about it? You know, I'm, I'm a little bit agnostic when it comes to casino gambling because on mm -hmm. one, one side I'm a, I'm a libertarian mm -hmm. figures, you know, adults ought to be allowed to do it. They, they um, want to do as long as it's not harming others. Um, I, on the other hand, I, I, I do think that it would ha be bad for a state image and it may well be bad for the state government to be intensely involved in regulating gambling this way. Um, but, but what bothers me more than anything as this develops is the way that um, it's being wired towards that one company, that one place. You know, there's, there's great representatives from the North Country have worked term after term to bring casino gambling to the North company, Country. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think of um, one, one friend of mine, Edmund Giannette, who's a, uh, a sixth or seventh term representative from uh, Lincoln, which is, you know, up, up mm -hmm. on the Kangamangas Highway. And, and uh, he's worked for, for years at the behest of his town officials to try to get a proposal for it, and, and we're just ignoring the North Country once, once again. So um, if we're going to do it, I think it would be... And that be, would be a destination. It, it, I mean, it, much it, more so than Salem, it, for example. Well, I think it would be. I, you know, I, I just don't see it with one or two mm -hmm. $1 billion casinos mm -hmm. that are going to be constructed in Massachusetts that people are going to come up to a $350 million mm -hmm. casino mm -hmm. in, in southern New Hampshire. That is not going to be a destination. No, people like the glitz, the entertainment <laughs> venues, the restaurants, all the rest sure, of it. You know, I think That's as why the, Vegas is successful. Sure, I think as Drew Klein said in, in uh, The Union Leader in an editorial, it's going, we're going to have a casino ghetto here yeah, in New Hampshire. Yeah, I saw that. And, and that's just, it's not the image we want, but if we're going to do it, it ought to be like any other uh, industry that isn't criminal. We just say, if you want to engage in it, buy a license, put it where your local uh, authorities say you can put uh, businesses, and, and uh, pay your taxes instead of creating a monopoly for, for one favored company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, another thing, I, and I know that the proponents do push that there'd be lots of jobs. Well, yeah, there'll be some construction jobs building it, but, of course, those are short term. Um, but they do throw around, well, there'd be tons of casino jobs. And I did see, I just saw it today, so I don't know if it was published today or, or within the past couple of days, but Representative Steve Valancourt um, put an op-ed into the Foster Dill, a Democrat, that was pretty fascinating. Yes. Now, I'm not a great rememberer of numbers, so I'm just going to kind of like pull out, you know, the major gist of what I got out of it. But what he did was he gathered information from all over the country on the actual number of casino workers there are in all of the states that, that do have casino gambling. And one of the things that came across very quickly is that in the past couple of years, because of the economy, the number of workers has dropped very significantly because their businesses have been affected as well. But the other thing that he was most interested in finding was, okay, how great paying are these jobs? Because we in New Hampshire keep hearing this will open the door to so many well-paying jobs. And I mean, they do use that as an argument. Sure. And what was interesting was when he kind of got the aggregate numbers and, and he explained that, yeah, we're talking, you know, when he'd get a number from a casino, for example, um, they'd say we have X amount of work is in the thirty dollars to $38,000 range, but that would include the benefit package. So what he did was he got those, those gross numbers and brought them to people who were very good at breaking those down. I guess one of them was Representative Neil Kirk. From where, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and as we all know, he's kind of a financial wizard. And they looked at all of it and kind of started, you know, taking those numbers and what the cost of health insurance and so on was that was into the package. And lo and behold, 
the average pay for casino workers seems to be, now granted there are some on the manager, managerial end making big bucks, mm -hmm. but the majority are making between 20 and 24 grand for and, an and, and you salary. can't raise a family on that. No, you cannot. You, you know, for, th for those of uh, the proponents of casino gambling that talk about jobs, if they are really concerned about jobs, if they want to put their effort to the best use, then they ought to join us in supporting right to work. Mm -hmm. um, because if we had right to work legislation passed in New Hampshire, then we could go to uh, Boeing and, and mm -hmm. Amazon.com and mm -hmm. all these companies that have great jobs. You know, where Amazon.com has warehouse jobs paying $25 an yeah. hour. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Boeing has, uh, I've been down in South Carolina and, and gone by the plant they have uh, there that uh, it's going to be building Dreamliners. Those are jobs paying 50 to $60 an hour to manufacturing workers. Those are the type of jobs that you can build a life yes. around. Um, not not some twenty thousand no. dollar a year job no. in gambling and, and and people don't realize how tenuous are the economics of these these casinos. The last casino that opened in New Jersey went bankrupt several months ago. Um, it's 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 a boom and a bust industry. Did Donald Trump even bail out? Yeah, uh, he he has bailed out, <laughs> but you know he bails and out he, most he of his businesses. And he has gazillions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic. I, I want to be respectful of, for example, the citizens in Salem who have voted mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, I guess, in, in the municipal election last fall, um, their support of uh, gambling. But I, I get concerned about the effect that it will have on state government to try to be involved in the regulation of such a cash-intensive but f heavily regulated business. I get concerned about the uh, tourism image of, of New Hampshire because, you know, our main route into the state is, is Route 93. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you greet it immediately mm -hmm. with a, a casino, it's going to change our, our tourist I image. Um, from what has been very positive up to that. And I get concerned that we're, we're favoring one business over again. Um, you know, any, anyone who has uh, some money and wants to take a, a chance on investing it in this industry. So, but, you know, going back to the budget, it, it's, it's uh, building a budget with an $80 million hole yeah. that starts right away. Yeah. $80 million is a lot in, in the Hampshire government. You know, ha having been I some, think it's a lot. <laughs> well, having, having been someone who put together a budget, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't Washington. Or it's, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, New York or California or Massachusetts where they, you know, throw a billion dollar here, a billion there. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in New Hampshire, that's, that's a big hole. Yeah, it and, is. And uh, it's going to lead to a budget that will be very unstable and require us to do what we had to do the last two Democrat budgets we had, which is in the middle, open them up again and try to find more revenue. And we'll end up doing what the Democrats did last time, which is start laying off workers, state mm -hmm. workers, uh, a mm -hmm. year into the two-year budget, start raising taxes, mm -hmm. or start borrowing money. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, one of the things we didn't have to do in the budget we put together is, is open it up and do any of those things. And yet, your budgets were vilified. You know, what, what people should begin to understand um, in order to um, appreciate the benefit of our budget is that we only spent the money that we have. Yes. Um, and we chose not to raise yes. taxes. There were three states in the country this past two years that lowered their taxes, um, and we were one of them. And so we put together only a three. Only three. Uh, and and um, we put together a budget that met the core functions of government, met desirable functions of government. There was a lot of rhetoric, and, and in one sense, we welcomed the harshness in which it was mm -hmm. described because the result no way approached that harshness. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a budget that met New Hampshire's needs. But oh, yeah, what, there were but, all kinds of dire predictions. Oh, yeah, you know, people were going to starve. Oh, yeah, know, and I remember life, that. Life would yeah. come to end as we know yeah. it. And, you know, I think for most of us, it, it turned out to be okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, what is, is really telling now is even with all, we can get into it, all the 200 and I think it's $63 million worth of tax increases that um, the, the House Democrats and the governor have put into the, their budget proposal, even with that, they, their rhetoric is, oh, those dastardly Republicans, when they put together their budget, they cut so much that we can't restore it all at once. Well, mm -hmm. you can't restore it all at once mm -hmm. because you have the same 
um, dilemma that we had, which is there's only so much money. Exactly. And, and we weren't willing to raise taxes. They are. We didn't think it's necessary. They do. We can still talk about how it isn't necessary. But it, it's, it's a matter of only spending the money you have. Well, I mean, just the whole premise of raising taxes right now is so bad, though. To begin with, I mean, there are so many people out of work. There are so many people just barely making it. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of living on that proverbial thread that you, the slightest little thing can, you know, just throw them right overboard for crying out loud. You, you know, Kathy, what's been sort of a discouraging <coughs> debate Excuse was um, the Democrats have come forward and said, look, it, our, our highway infrastructure is falling apart. And, and, you know, it's, it's been a debate. That, that didn't happen overnight either. <laughs> no, and it's been a debate that they've been yeah. saying this for 20 years. Yeah. It was a, 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 people won't remember, but in the 1996 gubernatorial campaign between Ovid Lamontain and, and Gene Shaheen, this was mm -hmm. a big issue. We had red-listed bridges and now mm -hmm. have red-listed bridges again. Putting aside uh, in a second what is a red-listed bridge, a red-listed bridge is a marketing term. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any bridges falling down. Mm -hmm. In my district, there is a red-listed bridge. Um, it's Route 13 going north into New Boston. That bridge going over the Little River there is red-listed. It's been red-listed since 1984. Now, oh, oh. <laughs> So it's going into its fourth decade of being red listed. It has managed not to fall down during that time. Now, Kathy, I drive over that bridge every day when I go up to Concord. I've yeah. kayaked under that bridge. Um, the bridge is in fine shape. The reason it's red listed is because it's thought to be functionally obsolete, which means it doesn't meet uh, current federal highway standards. Because if that you is an excellent point. Yeah, if you if you if you come down that road, it's yeah. a pl pl New yeah. Boston, such That's a an pretty, excellent point. pretty town. You come down a road, and it's coming down a hill, and it swerves away its round and it reaches the vid bridge, and and, and that's not um, federal highway mm -hmm. standards anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd want mm -hmm. to blast right through mm -hmm. and, and and put a straight um, approach to the bridge. But, but it doesn't mean that it's a bridge that needs to be repaired. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because, now, you know, you may be my memory bank go back because some years back I worked for an organization, a national organization, lobbying for them called Highway Users Federation, which was the consortium mm -hmm. of, of many different factions, oil industry, auto industry, highway industry, you know, the whole nine yards. And it was kind of that consortium that through the years when they were getting federal highway acts passed and such came up with that kind of terminology. Yep. And, and, you know, being away from it for so long, I've kind of forgotten about it. But what you said, functionally obsolete. Yeah, can mean a whole bunch of things. Nothing which really has to do with whether that bridge is going to fall down or if you're taking your life into your hands. Exactly. And you know, you know what I found out in the middle of the debate, too, is they have something you may not have heard because they've become more sophisticated perhaps in the marketing over the years. They have something they call pink listed bridges, which is on the way to be red listed. So I, I don't know. Yeah, well, but, I hadn't heard the pink listed. Yeah, so, so, so we, we, but. I, I think none of us would walk away from an understanding that says maintaining our highway infrastructure is a core function, yeah. an important function of government. And uh, so we said, fine, if it's reached a crisis point that we need to increase the gas tax, let us look first at where we're using the money that mm -hmm. comes from the gas tax, mm -hmm. because they came forward with a proposal that would raise the gas tax 83 percent, mm -hmm. a billion a dollars, money. a lot of money. As, and as that Nashua rep, wasn't he the one that said the gift it, that keeps on giving? He, he, he um, didn't intend for that email <laughs> to come out. He sent but it, it did. To, he sent it to a couple of his colleagues um, on the uh, various committees, I guess some committee chairs, not realizing, you know, I've been up there for a while, so about 45 minutes after he sent it out, it came to me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I looked at it and we, yeah. and we saw, well, it, it is the gift. That, and what he meant by that is that the funds are diverted away from the Highway mm -hmm. Trust Fund. And, and they're sent to trails, they're sent to the Attorney General's office, yes, they they're are. sent to the Department of State, they're sent to all over the yes. place. And so what we did was we went to um, the current majority and said, you know, if, if it has become a, a crisis, our highway infrastructure, if there's these red listed bridges that need to be repaired, um, shouldn't we look at what we're, we're mm -hmm. using on, uh, money now? Because right now, 30% uh, of highway funds that come from registrations, uh, motor vehicle registration, come from the gas tax, are diverted out, out oh. of, away from bridge and road repair. And we said, you know, if we, if we just brought all that back in, we wouldn't need this tax at mm -hmm. all. 
And they said, oh, no, you know, first it was, that means that the state police would get, and they actually got up on the House floor, state police would have to lay everyone off. Well, oh, that's we, not really true. It, it turned out not to be true at no. all. It, it turned out not to be true at no. all. It turned I out mean, that, I have nothing against the state police, but that no. certainly would not mean they all got laid off. No, and first of all, they aren't all funded by this diverted right. money. Right. But, but secondly, the point we made was this. The, there is a provision in the Constitution, the Hampshire Constitution, that was enacted in 1938 that said gas tax mm -hmm. and motor vehicle registration mm -hmm. fees are supposed to go to the highways. And we said, why don't we just obey the Constitution on that and, and let the state police, the Department of Safety, come in just like the Department of Health and Service, mm -hmm. Human Services comes in when it comes to the Children in Need of Services program mm -hmm. or the Developmentally Disabled Weight Program or just like the university system comes in when they want their contribution mm -hmm. uh, from, from the legislature and make a case because mm -hmm. that's what responsible elected officials do is they stand in place of a public that has varying interests. They want to make sure um, we're mm -hmm. decent as a society, we meet, meet mm -hmm. our core functions, but they don't want to be taxed too much. And, and they don't want to be taxed when it's unnecessary. So we stand there and we make decisions. Uh, come in and have the Department of Safety make a, 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 a proposal for how many state police officers they need and, and the funding of them. Don't talk about red-listed bridges and say, yeah. okay, we got that money, and then go kind yeah, of give it exactly. to, the, to the state, exactly. uh, the Department of Safety. I said, that's not, that's not transparent, open, honest governing. And, you know, we said, you know, that, that, that um, extra 3 or $4 of fill-up, because that's what that, this tax would yes, mean. Yes, I would. I said that, you know, uh, Representative John Bird from Gosstown had a great way of bringing it home. He said, I have a constituent, Tina, who is a um, sales clerk at a convenience store. Um, you know, she has a car, van, and when she fills it up, it's 50 or $60. Mm -hmm. It's now going to be $3 more to mm -hmm. fill it up. That's, that's a gallon of milk. For it her. is. And, and that's, you know, for... for for Dave Campbell, for me, for, for the other folks, you know, mm -hmm. it's okay. You know, we, we look at it and go, that's kind of irksome, but it's, it's not life-changing. Um, they don't realize that there are people who live on very limited means, and, and that's important money. Who are money, already on the edge. Who are already on the edge. And so, you know, so what they've done is they, they, they listen to us and they realize this isn't working out well. We don't want to go to the people with a billion-dollar tax increase, so mm -hmm. we're going to be more reasonable. Let's make it a $750 million tax increase, 67%. Peanuts. And they, and they passed huh. that. Now, it's over in the Senate. I don't think there's a great deal of willingness on the part of uh, the Republicans who are in the majority in the Senate to pass that. And so um, it would surprise me, at least, if it comes out in, in the budget that comes out of the Senate. Now, as you know, once the budget comes out of the uh -huh. Senate, then there's bargaining. We'll see what that goes. But, you know, this increase is, is just like they, they increased the tax on home heating oil. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Kathy. This session? This session. That already went? Uh, it, it, no, I, I wasn't aware that that had passed. And, and so we're sitting there. The when House the, has passed. The House has passed. But not it. the Senate yet, Not right? the Senate yet. Okay. Um, so we're sitting there, and, and uh, we watch this bill come forward uh, in the House session, and it's going to increase the home heating oil environmental tax 25%. And fortunately, some Republicans had been following that, and they got up and talked and said, the, the fund is growing. There you are know, people who can't pay their home heating oil bill now. I understand. Who, <laughs> who you know, are, are kind of turning off the heat whenever they can to save the, the few drops that are left in the tank. I, exactly. And exactly. So 25% increase in, That's in, a lot. In, in the tax itself. And, and uh, so, you know, we said, uh, uh, why are you doing this? You know, and they said, well, you know, environmental fund, it's cleanup fund. And somebody pointed out who had done some research on it, said, well, the fund is growing each year, even with the current tax. You don't mm. need more tax. Mm. Oh, no, environment is great, you know, and all that. So they passed it. Ninety-five percent of the Democrats who were in the majority voted for it. So it, it went out of the House. How many people do you think Heat with Oil know about that? Because um, that would be kind of one of those little sleeper things that you know, gets people, tossed in that people would not even know was on the Well, they, on won't, the know. they won't know what's on the bill. You know, it just no. comes and it's a shocking bill. Or, yeah. or they're like a lot of people and they say, I have 500, in the middle of winter, they say, I do have $500. I guess I'll order, you know, maybe a couple hundred gallons of yeah. oil yeah. And, and see how far we can stretch it. Uh, and they can't stretch it as far if this 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 yeah, exactly. uh, this uh, tax in increases, and so we sat there, you know, even even knowing that we're dealing with a, a crowd who really loves to increase taxes, like some more money in in government, we're saying, well, why would they do this? It became apparent when Governor Hassan presented her budget to the um, House because that's what is called a dedicated fund. There's approximately uh. 300 dedicated funds in in Hampshire government. 
and she can she, go into she, any she, put of them, a, she put a proposal in her budget that allows her to what she calls sweep what what That's, most of yeah. us would call raid yeah. those dedicated funds yeah. and sweep those funds and, yeah. and use it for other things that she's interested in. And so the larger the funds, you know, the the more money the more, take. the more there is to take. So, um, you know, this is this is this budget that they've put in forward, the budget that was passed out of the house has a headline increase in spending of 10%, but they did something. This is a back to we're back to budget gimmicks, Kathy. Um, if you remember last time they had uh, passed a budget. They took the liquor commission out of the budget, so yeah. they could say, you know, we didn't yeah. increase the general fund yeah. that much because they took six percent of it away yeah. and, and called away. They said that's a enterprise fund, I think, and so it doesn't have to be part of the general fund. And and then they went around talking about how we only increased uh, spending, you know, ten uh, percent um, when it was really sixteen percent because you took part of it out. Well, they've done that again. Um, they've taken um, what is called the room and board portion of the health and human services budget and they've taken they put it aside into a dedicated fund or general and they're saying it's only a 10 percent increase please please you know you, you republicans it's smoke and mirrors again mm. it's 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 not open and transparent um budgeting and and it's it's a budget that isn't good for new hampshire it's you know it's back to you know borrowing to pay off operating expenses mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. 263 million dollars in, in new taxes this this is what we struggled with. This this budget that you'd mentioned that was so harshly criticized was us correcting um, what it's had been awesome. four sure. years. You know, in that yeah. four years, the past the four years the Democrats were in, they increased the bar, borrowing more than had been increased in the thirty years before that. Thirty. Thirty years before that, and 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 you know now we're at it again. You know, unfortunately, elections have consequences, and unfortunately, I think at some point, um, the people will be, well, fortunately, people will become aware of it. What is unfortunate is that we'll have to go through another period of austerity in which they'll, they'll sit back and say, you know, you awful Republicans, you don't, you don't love the people, you don't care no, about no, it, well, and, and no, all that. That goes so, with the terrific. But, you know, it's, it's disturbing because I think most people, the average person, has no clue how many different ways these things are going on. I mean, we hear about the big ones, right. you know, the gas tax or the tobacco tax, the ones that are, you know, bloody battles in the state house, but all these other little uh, kind of crackerjack things that they, that are going on and the little deals that are being made, we're not hearing about, we're not reading about. And, and people have a right to expect yeah, I would their, say. their representatives to act responsibly, and this is not acting responsibly. And and so, you know, I, I, I can remember for years and years, you know, I'd lived in New Hampshire and I was commuting mm -hmm. down to Boston mm -hmm. every day. and. You know, I'd leave at 5, 5.30 in the morning, yeah. get home at 7 at night. And, and it, it's difficult to pay attention to yeah, all these issues. Is. But, you, but yeah. there is sort of this assumption that if you, someone puts themselves forward as a legislative candidate and you elect them, they're going to be, you know, some will be liberal, some will be conservative, but they'll all be responsible. This just isn't responsible. Oh, I don't think they're all responsible. Well, I think you know, too many of them are too in tune with their party lines and, and not willing to make hard decisions. Yeah, That's I mean, my we, opinion. We, 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 look at these, we look at these votes, for example, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that is, for better or worse, is the hallmark of the Republicans is that there's a lot of dissenters and there's mm -hmm. a, it is a, it's truly a broad tent. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who are quite modern. A lot of people mm -hmm. were quite True. quite conservative, yeah. but you look at the the uh, Democratic vote. You know, ninety six percent of Democrats. I'm voted not hearing much dissent going on. No, ninety six percent of them voted to raise the gas tax. Ninety five percent voted to raise the home heating oil tax. A hundred percent of them voted to. Every last one of them voted to repeal the voter ID law. Now, see, and, that is inconceivable to me, because that a hundred percent anybody on anything. It's almost impossible to gain. Yeah. So, I mean, that can't be because some of these people are sitting there honestly evaluating the issue and looking at the pros and cons and, and genuinely trying to make a fair judgment. That has to be because this is party line and I'm going with it. You know, I have a Democratic representative. And that's a disservice to us. I have a Democratic representative who's sitting next to me, and, and she's a good lady. She really is. A lot of them are very de decent people. She's a very good lady. And every once in a while, I'll be talking to her saying, you know, Mary, you can't vote that way. I mean, have you listened? she go, oh, yeah, you're right. And then she'll, she'll vote, you know, using her good common sense. And then she'll sit there afterwards going, you know, is that a roll call vote? Are they going to find out about that? Uh, um, you know, there's just this fear there. And, and so, 
You look look at these votes. I mean, ninety five. Oh, that's true. Because if it's just an I or a nay vote, it, you know, it, people can hide. Yeah, you know, there's three ways we vote up there. We have yeah. a voice vote, yeah. um, and then we have what is called yeah. a division vote. We figure the overall totals, mm -hmm. but not how each representative voted. And then you have roll call, which is mm -hmm. your, your vote is recorded. I think, for example, the default always ought to be roll call. When I was as speaker, you know, people assumed I'd be like speakers in the past, and you know, think oh, I don't want the delay of roll call. Why mm -hmm. are you doing this? I welcomed it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think everybody, for the reasons we're talking about here, I think everybody has a right to know how their representative I, I think is, so. is voting. I think so. And, and, uh, so and can't, can't they vote also on a bunch of bills at once? There, there is a portion of the calendar. We have a calendar that shows what we're going to be doing every yes. day. Uh, and and uh, there's what's called the consent yes. calendar and then the regular calendar. Yes. The consent calendar are all those bills that are presumably non-controversial where it's come out of the committee, committee saying enact it, don't enact it. Lots and, of can get buried in that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one of the things I think it behooves all of us as, as state representatives to do is to look those over. And I know there's a number of us who do that because any representative can take a bill off the consent calendar and require it to be on the, the regular calendar. And it is that easy, is it not? It's just one representative one can, yeah, can take it off and require a separate debate on, mm -hmm. on the, and separate vote on that bill. It, it takes 10 rep, uh, actually 11, w one representative to move it, 10 to second um, the motion to have a roll call vote, but, but at least any representative can require a division vote to can move away from a voice vote. And I mean, I don't really want to hear representatives say, oh, we're busy, oh, there's too many bills to read or whatever. You know what? They ran for office. You know, it's pretty clear that you have to put the time into it. Right. And I really don't want to hear excuses from any rep, whether it's my own local one or not, yeah. that uh, they're just too busy to read all these things. Well, then don't run. No, I, exactly. I mean, would we be pleased if, uh, you know, a member of the Board of Selectmen or, yeah. or a town council? No, I didn't have time. Board of no. Aldermen uh, men <laughs> members said, yeah, I just don't have the time. Yeah, to, you really. Know, just, didn't, you, didn't you know how busy it would be? You're right. That's just a poor excuse. It, it, it's an inadequate excuse because um, you know when you go up there, it's going to be a job that requires a lot of work. We we have hundreds of bills every year, and you know I, I, I know term after term, I've sat there and read all those, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm not unique. There are many who do. There's many who complain. And there are many it. who don't. That's that's right. And, that's right. and uh, you know, I mean, frankly, there are many who use it as a stepping stone to something else and, and, and so, show up basically when they have to. Yes, yeah, and, so and I, I think it, that's one of the things wrong with. Maybe a legislature so big, it's easy to, it's easy to kind of hide in the crowd. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and, but but the other thing many, about you know? it is, I think a legislature that big, it's, it's still a great institution we have. I totally this, this agree. This volunteer legislature, yeah. you don't tend to get the careerists up there. You tend to get people who reflect what is good about New Hampshire government. You know, I've, I've often said when I've gone and spoken out of state about the miraculous. Um, uh, result of our constitution that we see in governance in New Hampshire because you don't get any a, a, a salary sufficient to live mm -hmm. on until oh, you get God, to be no. What is governor. it, a couple hundred a year or something? It's, uh, uh, which is it? A couple hundred, no, a hundred a year. That's a hundred. hundred. Year, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, not until you get to be governor do you earn enough mm -hmm. money to, to live mm -hmm. on. And, and that is, you know, a miracle compared to other states. You know, I, I was talking to um, a speaker of, well, we've stayed, one of the big urban states. And, you know, as often comes up, they're saying, well, how much do you guys get paid? You know, well, actually, it started off this way. Um, she was saying, you know, we have kind of a, a volunteer citizens legislature. And I said, well, how's that work? And, and, and she said, well, you know, um, we only get, you know, about base of about 12000 a year, and we mm -hmm. do get a per diem of $400 a day when we're there, and, and we do get health insurance, you know, paid. Yeah, but, kind of but, 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 you know, that's not money you can live on. And so we're citizen legislature. I said, well, let me tell you about a citizen legislature. You get $100 a year. And, and if you speak, you get 125 a year. You get a license plate. Uh, you do Big get the license. You have to pay for the license plate, though. Oh, you do? Oh, sure. Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. Excuse me. I didn't know that. I thought they just gave you those. Oh, no. You have to, you have to pay. I, I, I think it's $10 a set. Oh, for crying like out loud. Yeah. I would have thought that would have been at least one perk, you know. Yeah, well, you know, it, it pays for the cost of printing them up and, or, and Bosnian, what do they do? And, and so I think it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I never knew they had to pay for them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Well, obviously, the, you know, we, we've covered by talking about the budget things like the gas tax and then the whole gaming issue, um, which I don't know, you know, what's going to happen with all that. Um, 
cigarette tax, of course, is part of all of that. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, know, I, I, I think that most of us would agree that you shouldn't smoke cigarettes. Cigarettes is, is, is um, something that in the end will kill most people who do it. I, you know, we always have the anecdote of, you know, gran grandma smoked till she was 101 and all that. Well, most of us know that's just not something that's good for you. But, you know, we're adults. And if we start through taxes trying to control bad mm -hmm. behavior, there's no mm -hmm. end of it. You find yourself down to the level of a Mayor Bloomberg who's mm -hmm. saying you can't buy too much soda at one I, time. Yeah, to me you that's know, and, bizarre. And, and, totally and, bizarre. And so the, the Democrats out of the House passed a 30 cent a pack increase. And that's a lot at once. It, it, you know, the, the, uh, profile of the average smoker, adult smoker in New Hampshire, is someone who earns twenty-six thousand really? dollars a year. It tends to be lower-income people who smoke, and so we're basically saying to those lower-income people, "You're such bad individuals. We're going to build our budget on you." Um, that that's just not right. President Obama and his budget has proposed a two-dollar increase in the, in a pack I of cigarettes. That. If we have this thirty-cent increase, yeah. it will take. State taxes up yeah. to $2. Federal taxes yeah. um, will go up to $3. There'll be a $5 a pack tax on cigarettes, even before, you know, the, the tobacco companies start and the retailers start putting um, whatever they need on it to, to, uh, to, to make Plant a profit. cigarettes over 10 bucks a pack in New York? Uh, well, they are now. They are. That's and my I understanding. I think in Massachusetts they're getting up. Pretty yeah. close to now. They, they are. I mean, they, they, the problem with that is you start making a legal product mm. into contraband mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there are states still where um, cigarettes are sold for, mm -hmm. you know, with a tax of like 30 cents or 20 cents. Um, so, you know, you start getting criminal behavior. Yeah, some of the southern states, the tobacco growing states. Yeah, yeah, they're still, they're very they're cheap still quite there. low. It, but, but more important, it's just demonizing a dis yeah. disfavored yeah. group. I mean, eventually. Um, what's to stop them from saying, you know, if you weigh too much, you know, particularly the Obamacare. That's, that's actually one of the reasons I was such an opponent of Obamacare, because it gives the federal mm -hmm. government an excuse to get involved in the most intimate details of our life and start penalizing us. Um, we Do you think people understand the impact of Obamacare in New Hampshire yet? I don't think they understand the individual impact. I don't think they understand the business impact. I don't think they understand the state budgetary impact. The individual impact, maybe they have a better sense of it. You know, they, they, they're basically saying this is government oriented mm -hmm. itself to us in a different way. In, in the first few centuries of our republic, there was an understanding that there is a government and citizens control that government. Now we seem to be over the last 50 years slipping away from that, almost to the point where it's, it's not inaccurate to say that government has subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and government controls those subjects. And we, we hear about it in so many different re regulatory outrages. Um, and this is just one more step where, where government's going to tell us what to do rather than us mm -hmm. telling the government what to do. It's a different orientation um, to government. Uh, I, I, when it comes to businesses, you know, we, we, Regal Cinema, Cinema, for example, which employs thousands of people, mm -hmm. has announced that it's taking uh, um, all its full-time employees, except for a very limited group, and take them back down to 20 hours, 29 hours a week, so they don't I have to I have a family pay. member that just got that news. Yeah, that, that they're going under 30 hours. Yeah, and, and, and you know, this in the middle of a yeah. of a jobs recession. Yeah. You know, people tell us that the recession ended three years ago, four years ago, two, whatever it is. Not, not for most of us who are, uh, have jobs or are looking for jobs mm -hmm. or have a couple of part-time jobs that have been cobbled together. And, and to try to come out of mm -hmm. this jobs recession with legislation like that is it's just... That's a big hit it's a to huge, have that many hours taken hit. out of your pay every it's week. It's a huge hit. And, and, you know, that's, that's a huge example of it. But I have um, friends who own small businesses, restaurants, and mm -hmm. so forth, good people. There's one, one fellow came to... Uh, uh, to New Hampshire about eight years ago, I think, and, and now he employs 75 people in his restaurant, providing really good jobs, a lot of full-time jobs. I was talking to him, and he's saying, I have to take down those jobs to, to back to, you know, 29 hours a week. I cannot afford... You won't be able to survive otherwise. Yeah, I, he won't be. He says, we don't make this kind of money. You know, yeah. we, we, just, we just don't and make And it's not like of. he can raise his, his meal prices because he'll wind up going out of business. No, you know... The, the, the basic family policy that will comply with Obamacare 
is going to cost, they're saying right now, $21,000 a year. Good God. Now, I started, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I started, um, a, 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 we bought a, a supermarket, a shopping center with my older brother about 30 years ago. And, you know, he's still running. We, I sold out my portion of it. But I can remember running that with him. We had about 30 or 40 employees. Mm -hmm. And there's no way we could have paid for that. We would have mm -hmm. gone out of business. Oh, yeah. And, and so clearly what has to happen there is rather than us having, you know, 30 full-time, maybe five or 10 part-time jobs, we're going to have to have 50 or 60 part-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And those people are going to have to go to other places mm -hmm. and get part-time jobs in mm -hmm. order to live. And, and, and that's not a way to come out of a recession. So on, uh, its effect on business is poor. But let me tell you what its effect on, on state government is going to be. And this is one of the reasons that I struggled so hard in the last year when I was speaker to avoid accepting the Medicaid expansion in New Hampshire. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, so, so Joan, just to... Just we're talking some enormous numbers. We are talking. You know, if you, just to remind um, your viewers, Medicare is the um, f fully federally funded program for senior f right. people. That's not what we're talking about. All right. What we're talking about is Medicaid, which is actually a volunteer program for states to um, uh, engage in. I think the last state that came to Medicaid was Alaska in the 1980s. But the whole program as an option for states started in the 1960s. And it's a far be it from perfect program. I mean, it's only a few months ago we found out some of the abuses that already <sighs> existed in New Hampshire. Well, well that, that's right. We found, you know, as I think I might have talked to you at one point. The EBT we, cards. The EBT the card. Yeah. We found, you know, when we, yeah. we, we did um, this program to test who was yeah. receiving it that, you know, 56, 56 people receiving um, Medicaid benefits in New Hampshire were dead. Yeah. When it died back in the 1980s. Some of them lived in other states. Many lived in other states. Yeah, so, I mean, crazy. it has its abuses, but that goes with government in many ways, and you have to constantly struggle. To, and I think, I think we came up with, if they'd only adopted, some solutions to deal with that. But, but even assuming legitimacy mm -hmm. uh, of all recipients, mm -hmm. what will happen is, is two things. One is, that the federal government is saying, we want you to expand mm -hmm. the eligibility for this mm -hmm. program to go from 66% of federal poverty level up to 138%, almost double it. I guess it's a little bit over, doubling the, the eligibility. Now, I'm um, told that could increase as many as 50,000 people to the New Hampshire it, it, rolls. It, it could. And they're, and they're saying, the, the reason you want to do this is because we'll pay 90% of it at least for a while. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, and, and, Money from heaven again. And huh? so, so, you know, many, you know, it, it came up in the House floor because I had filed a bill this time which was defeated by the majority saying we won't agree to expand it. And they're saying, well, this is federal money. But, you know, the point I made is we're American citizens, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, we have an obligation to our country, just not our state, and that's going to bankrupt us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar now. We, we, we shouldn't, if, if they're acting this foolishly, in Washington, we shouldn't participate. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 should, we should have some responsibility to others. Well, that didn't persuade them. And, and I said, well, then the second reason we shouldn't do it is it's still going to cost us about $80 million a year. Mm -hmm. just, just to pay, you know, 10% uh, of a huge number is still a huge number. That's right. And, and so we shouldn't, shouldn't do this. And then third, you know, people should remember federal promises in the past. The federal government was going to pay 40% of special education um, uh, costs um, for children. You know, these, the, the, the very uh, mm -hmm. uh, area where many of our town budgets, our school mm -hmm. budget budgets, are just just um, uh, thrown thrown apart. And you know, right now they're at like 17 percent. They've never been much above 27 percent. It's been going and down. That's one of the biggest cost drivers in it, education. It, it is. It really is. So I said, you know, this this promise won't be kept. Yeah. We know it won't be kept because we know our federal government is, is running out of money. We know that there's going to be a federal budgetary crisis at some point um, where they're just going to run out of money, and they're going to throw this whole burden onto the state. And once you expand um, a, a program in government, it's, it's very hard to oh, yeah. pull it back. It's yeah. very hard to go to people yeah. and say, you know what, we're reducing yeah. it back down to 66% because that 50,000 people will be storming the state statehouse. Um, and, 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 uh, Interestingly enough, most of those people who would be brought under it now, 90% of them already have health insurance um, through their employers. So basically, with some of them, we're encouraging them to come off. We're, we're, we're encouraging them to come off of, uh, of private insurance. We're encouraging government dependency. 
you know, we're encouraging a family of four who's earning, I think, what is it, almost 38,000, 40,000 a year to become government dependent. And, and, and it's going to be hard. You know, again, that, that policy that they're mm -hmm. going to get would cost $21,000 in the, in the uh, private marketplace. Mm -hmm. If you're earning 38, 40,000 a year, you're, you're basically saying to those people, you don't come off welfare. Mm -hmm. Until you're earning sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. um, and and you know you you wonder whether that's part of their goal is to create more dependence, but there's even something worse than this. Um, with that Medicaid, you've heard of the health care exchange. Yes. One of the options, if we put that in place, now Hassan is for that, is she, she not? She is. Yes. Okay. Now, one of the options uh, for insurance will be Medicaid. Now. Right now, only 50% of the people who are eligible for Medicaid take it in Hampshire. Now, and there's various reasons why they don't. Again, a lot of them already have insurance mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, don't need it. You know, they're working at Walmart. People don't realize Walmart provides insurance mm -hmm. um, for people, not, not a, a $21,000 a year family mm -hmm. plan, right. but some basic yeah. insurance. Basic, yeah. And, and uh, there's... Um, a uh, generally accepted understanding, if you put those health care exchanges in and you're requiring people to go to them and get their health insurance with the exchange, that will happen is they'll say, well, no private company will cover you, but Medicaid will, will. And so you have something called the woodwork effect, like they're coming out of the woodwork. You will expand just naturally the population of people taking getting Medicaid by about 100 percent. Wow. And, and so that would be, in, in New Hampshire terms, without getting into the actual figures on how this is driven, uh, eventually, after about six or seven years, it would cost $500 million a year to the New Hampshire state budget. Understand, and then that's state spending. Understand, because that's not the 90% promise. That would just be people who are coming mm -hmm. on at the 50%, mm -hmm. which is what we have now, because that's what the pro Medicaid mm -hmm. program is. 50 state, 50 cent, roughly 50 cent state, 50 cent um, uh, federal government. So these people will be coming on. That will cost the state about $500 million a year. Our state spending over a two-year period, um, the state-funded portion of the budget and the budget that we put together is $4.2 billion. So you're actually you're, you're talking about another billion dollars every two years. Wow. That, that's, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at that, that's something that perhaps gives them what they want. You know, there's no way to handle that without a, a huge and new robust tax system, such as an income tax such as the sales tax. So, you know, this, this is a ch these, these little benign debates where the Democrats want to uh, drive the conversation mm -hmm. about talking mm -hmm. about how evil Republicans mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. not to be expanding government, and all oh, this, take the federal money. The reason that we are opposing it is because of the stark reality of what it would do to New Hampshire and, and, and what it would do to our system of government, it would, it would really expand it. It would require robust sources of taxation. It would change the state. Um, that is the state that all of us came to or decided to live in. Well, there's absolutely no question if, if we have a sales tax and an income tax that it will totally change the state. It, it would, you know, we... we and, there, and there would be people who would live. Because, frankly, I mean, if they can live for the same or less in states where they get more services, I mean, you're a native of Massachusetts, I'm a native of Massachusetts. I think we can both agree that there were many things in Massachusetts that we took for granted as part of our day-to-day -day life that we do without living in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if NIP came to tech at some point in time, um, especially as you get older and a less adventurous and want more things done for you, there'd be, there'd be reasons to say, you know what, it's not worth staying in New Hampshire anymore. Let's go back to our home states. Well, and I think, as you said, most of us who have come to New Hampshire came here because of the special way of life. Yeah. Um, the fact that um, government, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking as a young fellow when I decided to move up here with my, my young family, I wasn't thinking, you know, taxes are less because I wasn't earning that much money. And, and well, it, yeah. didn't, it didn't make yeah. that much difference. Most days, yeah, what, 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 what did make a difference to me is a uh, state in which government was less intrusive, mm -hmm. um, a, a state in, in, in which they lived up to their motto of live free or die. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember getting that job as well, a Well, cheaper young, housing attracted a lot of people, too, part, part of that, too. I can, uh, but I can remember getting a job um, along Route 128 as, mm -hmm. as a young fellow saying, well, this is great. This gives me an opportunity to raise my family, you know, 30, 40 miles north in, mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. 
Um, and, and it will change. I mean, will, we will truly be that, you know, northern suburbs of, mm -hmm. of uh, Massachusetts, of Boston. And I don't think most of us want to, do, to be there. No, I agree with you on that. You know, I, I often yeah. talked in the past um, about um, a, a real useful comparison, and that's Maine and New Hampshire. If you look at the two states right after World War II, demographically we were very similar. Our, our ethnic mix was about the same. Um, our, our income, our sources of, of personal income were about the same. Mm -hmm. Actually, Maine had a higher per capita income than, than Maine Hampshire. did. Uh, really? Right after World War II, it was a couple hundred dollars a year that. more, and and. For some reason, and, and you can speculate, and I think I, I understand why, we went one direction, they went another. The direction they went, went uh, led them to enact an income tax, which they didn't have, mm -hmm. led them to enact a sales tax. Man, it's we, expensive to it, live it's, in now. It's really expensive yeah. to live in. And New Hampshire went another direction. And now if you look at per capita income in New Hampshire, it's much higher than Maine. You know, we, uh, Maine is almost, you know, one of these kind of states at the end of the country mm -hmm. that doesn't have a dynamic economy. And we have um, an economy that gives us the third highest, I think it is, the third highest per capita income in the country. Um, if, well, if, if, you, if you look at... I didn't at, know that number either. Yeah, if you look at all the indicia of, of um, societal health, you know, number of children graduating from high school, going on to four-year college, graduating from college, getting um, immunizations, mm -hmm. um, intact families, children born into families, whether it's a biological father, a biological mm -hmm. uh, mother present, all these indicia of what's a healthy society, we, we're just head and shoulders above Maine. And I think it's because we made the choice to have a government that was small, a government that relied on individuals and families to be strong, and therefore they are strong. Mm -hmm. if, if government replaces uh, a, a family effort to take care of themselves, then they're going to have a weaker family, weaker society. Oh, we're certainly seeing enough evidence of that all over the place. Oh, we are. Yeah. So I, 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 I hate to, to lose that. Actually, Kathy, I have to tell you, and that's that's what part of the struggle is about. It's it's not a struggle to be mean to people, um, you know. It, it, it's it's a struggle, I think, to look at the long-term consequences of what our governmental policies are. The struggle in, in putting together the budget last time and, mm -hmm. and living with it, I mean, wasn't an academic exercise to to see if we could, you know, uh, live with eight hundred million dollars mm -hmm. left. Less. It was it was an effort to um, fulfill that New Hampshire tradition, to live within that New Hampshire tradition of having a government that is small, meets core functions, uh, it, uh, it handles some of the societal needs decently, but then says to people, you really got to take care of yourself and you got to take care of your loved ones. And, and you really have to you know, do what uh, all of us did when we were young and just out of school, work hard to, to yes. put together a life. Yes, and and that, we're not seeing enough of that anymore. No. I mean, truth be told, no. and if that sounds harsh, so be it. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things that, that shocked me, among many things that shocked me about um, what came out about these marathon bombers, was to hear the um, account of the life of the older than this 26-year-old yeah. man yeah. who um, apparently had, had his, his, his family, his young family, on welfare yep. um, and, you know, went off to Russia to do yep. whatever he wanted to. For Which is expensive no matter how you cut it, just the plain fare yeah. alone. And, and, you know, I, I think a lot of us who are, are further on in our years and have had a family can appreciate the days as I do when I was 26 years old, and I think I had two children at the time, and um, just kind of understood, I have to work. I have to go That's to work right. every day. I have to get That's the right. best job I can. Um, there, were, right. there was one point, even though I was a young lawyer, about a year or two out of school, um, where uh, you know I, I went and got a second job, you know, working mm -hmm. distributing newspapers mm -hmm. um, because the family needed money. It, it just never would occur to me to, in most of us, I'm not exceptional. No, no, I agree um, with you. To, to go on welfare. I agree with It you. was there. It was a safety that, net. That was seen as like a humiliating thing yeah, and, to, and, and, to have and to do that. that that's right. And, and you know, it, it's, it's fine. I was glad it was there. If somebody, mm -hmm. I didn't think about it much, but if someone came and said, would well, you glad this welfare? Sure, I don't want people to be out in the street mm -hmm. and starving and, and, and all. But the assumption was you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. You, you take right. care of your own. 
And, and I no more would have thought of leaving my, my wife and my children and going to see my ancestors in Ireland you know, for six months than, than I would exactly. have. Exactly. Um, as much know, fun as it might have been, it was not going yeah, to happen. It, it, was, it, was, it would have been as alien to me yeah. as yeah. You know, trying to book passage to the moon. You know, it's just, exactly. It, it's just, it, it doesn't make sense. And yet, we seem to have developed a different consensus, at least among some of us. Hey, I would say that they had life pretty good here. I mean, they both were in, in college. Um, you know, they were living in Cambridge, which is, as you well know, uh, no matter where you live in Cambridge, one of the high rent districts in Massachusetts. Um, and as you, you know, mentioned, um, I guess at the time of all of this, they were off of welfare, but were on it for a considerable amount of time. And we both know that doesn't just mean the welfare check in the mail. It means things like you don't have to worry about your utilities getting shut off, or you don't have to worry that you won't have phone service, or you don't have to worry that when the food money runs out, there's no food in the cupboard. Right. Um, you know, it just it kind of keeps going right. well beyond whatever the amount of that check is that arrives in the mail. And so I think part of what we saw there was a reflection of that. Oh, wow, we're almost out of time. <laughs> in, in, in part, part of it is, um, I think, the alienation that a lot of... Um, uh, Islamic extremists have towards the West. There's a great book I'd recommend to you and your, your viewers. It's by an author called Bernard Lewis. He's a great British historian, um, particularly of the Middle East. And the book's name is What Went Wrong? And, and in that book, he makes the point that you have a mindset among Islamic fundamentalists that is reflective of, of um, a society that fell apart almost a thousand years ago mm -hmm. and there's a great deal of ongoing bitterness that comes out of it and reflects itself in, in today's terrorism. I mean, if you have somebody like this young fellow who I guess, I guess became more uh, religious as time went, went on, he's looking at the successful civilization and saying there must be something really bad mm -hmm. about it. It needs yep. to be attacked because it's not Islam and we know Islam is, is pure. Um, Great book. You know, I'm, I'm not doing an, giving an adequate explanation of it, but I'd no, recommend but it, it to like, people. No, but it sounds like, yeah. Well, believe it or not, we are down to seconds. Uh, when I got so engrossed in conversation, I did a very bad job of keeping track of time. Can we get you back? Because there's still a lot more subjects to go. Absolutely, Kathy. Well, I, I look will, forward to I it. will give you a call, and we'll set something else up. Absolutely. Thanks. It's been Thanks great to be here. Thanks for being here. And we are running the clock right down, literally, into seconds. I think you can admit that whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, Bill O'Brien does know how to tell it like it is, and he does give the facts, and you really do need to listen to people like him. You know, even if you're a Democrat, listen to what Republicans have to say, because they have some good things to say this year, too. So you owe it to yourself to know both sides. So thanks for watching. Till next time, and we will have Bill back again. But thanks for watching, and until next time, you tell it like it is. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.